It starts with a phone call. A mother, a proud trans parent, gets in touch. One call becomes many. Carolina speaking. Hi, it's Natalie again. Can you talk? We meet many times. I never thought I'd tell anyone, especially not Mission Investigate. Natalie and her family have received upsetting news. It's about their youngest child. He's not growing. Standing up makes his back and body ache. I have no words for what I feel. I don't understand how they can hide things from people like this. In this episode, we tell their story of injured children and withheld information. It all plays out in the wake of a controversial decision. Hospital backs down. Karolinska University Hospital will no longer initiate hormone treatments on transgender adolescents. Within hours after the news broke, my inbox was filled with emails expressing surprise. You wrote, low evidence of effectiveness. Yes, this is about the lives of young people who are still developing. No one should be treated if we don't know it's safe and effective. What this decision doesn't look at is the risk of not giving someone necessary care. Karolinska Hospital's decision to stop new hormone treatments on children was the reason Natalie reached out. To protect her child, she's not showing her face. Their story begins when the family moves from southern Sweden to a municipality north of Stockholm. Their youngest daughter has something to tell them. That she is really a he. He was little, only 10, and telling us how he perceived himself. Our first thought was just to affirm our child. If our child feels this way, then of course we should affirm it. And just listen to him and follow his cues. He chose the name Leo, and he was really happy. He wanted everyone to know as soon as possible. We contacted the school, and I think they were very supportive. They changed the name on his shelf in the classroom. But after a while, we noticed that Leo was sad and depressed. Studies show that young trans people often have mental health problems perhaps because their body doesn't match their inner gender identity, a condition called gender dysphoria. Or it's the stress of feeling different and not being accepted by others. When did this happen? I resigned because my work situation was intolerable. They didn't know what to do with me. Because you were trans? Yes. For Anne Christine Ruth, it took over 50 years to dare to come out as a woman. The sound is on. Today, she is the chair of Trans Amans, an association for trans people and their families. Young people today can actually get help and live their lives fully. I had to put my life on hold for over 50 years. Now others don't have to. Living as a trans person is being questioned constantly. It starts with you questioning yourself. Is this really true? Can I trust it? 
Can I really assume this is me? If a young person at some point realizes I'm not the boy or girl everyone says I am, that's a huge step in a person's life. What amazing strength. You want me to look at you, right? Not into the camera. My name is Jeram Rostam, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the chair of the RFSL Youth, the youth organization for young LGBTQI people's rights. Society as a whole is much more open and inclusive. We've seen a lot of wins for trans rights in recent years. But there is still widespread transphobia that we see at all levels. These are young people who often have mental health problems and the healthcare system is more available and more aware now. We see trans people's rights being discussed and debated in general, in a way that in many ways questions the existence of trans people, the identity and rights of trans people. A relatively small part of our patients are helped by gender-confirming treatment. This means both legal rights and access to gender-confirming treatment. For people with gender dysphoria, the only thing we know helps is access to care and treatment. Leo started self-harming and was in a very, very bad place mentally. He stayed home from school, didn't want to do anything, and was very depressed. He stopped hanging out with friends. He saw himself as something strange that didn't fit in. In sheer desperation, we sought all the help we could get. We got in touch with the KID team at Astrid Lindgren's Children's Hospital. They said that the earlier you stop puberty, the better. So it was a good thing to give Leo puberty blockers. He was 11 years old. Picture a young person who at an early age knows that I'm not the girl that others tell me I am and who starts living as the boy he identifies as. Now that person is about to enter puberty. A young boy who now hears that he's going to start puberty, develop breasts and start menstruating. What young boy wouldn't feel deeply worried in a situation like that? This treatment makes it possible for a young person to avoid going through an unwanted puberty so they can develop in the way they perceive themselves. I trusted them when they said, this will help your child. When your child is as unhappy as Leo, you'll do anything. Young people with gender dysphoria are often offered puberty blockers. The idea is to give them time to decide on hormone treatment. To develop female, they receive estrogen. To develop male, testosterone. Karolinska's new guidelines call these controversial treatments with no scientific support. We have investigated transgender care in several previous reports. The topic has become increasingly infected. In tonight's program, we enter a minefield. In several reports, we've covered transgender care for young people. The healthcare system hasn't got a clue. They're experimenting on young people with their lives ahead of them. We met Micah, who regretted her gender reassignment and detransitioned. 
we highlighted the risk of regretting and the risks of hormone treatments. These only go 10 years. How long? I've been taking them since I was 18, so that's almost 20 years. Nothing can be done about my body. The surgeries and everything are irreversible. The changes to the body and the voice are permanent. In recent years, the number of patients has exploded. The clinics have had difficulty keeping up. Cues have grown and doctors have left the field. It all came down to my conscience. As a doctor, I wasn't prepared to take the risk of harming these patients. So I took the consequences of that and resigned. I want to point out the seriousness of detransitioning. Living as a detransitioned person is no is not something you want to do. It's not nice. This is the only care available. Should we deny them that care? Since these reports, the Riksdag has debated trans health care. Several reviews have found scientific support for hormone treatment weak. The National Board of Health is developing knowledge support for treating young people with gender dysphoria and assessing what hospitals will be able to provide this care. The programs were hotly debated. Many in the trans movement were upset. As we prepared this report, warnings went out on social media that trans people should not participate in the report. Mission Investigate is at it again. Don't talk to them. The consequence of criticizing trans health care is that our conviction is called into question. No other patient group faces this. And that means that suspicions are aroused. They can't be serious. They don't really mean it. That's not possible, is it? We have to remember that countless people have had their lives improved thanks to this treatment. They can now live in society as the man or woman or boy or girl they see themselves as. And that's the point of this treatment, to help people. Hormone treatments of children began around the millennium at the Gender Identity Clinic for Young People in Stockholm. Since then, more clinics have opened in the country. Treatment involving puberty blockers was developed in the Netherlands. It revolutionized trans health care by using medicine to stop the progression of puberty. The method is called the Dutch Protocol. Annelou de Vries is one of the pioneers behind it. When I started in the field more than 15 years ago, it was like a rare thing. Most people didn't even know something like being transgender existed. The challenge is, are children capable of making these decisions at such a young age? That's also why the Dutch protocol is so beautifully developed because it starts with puberty blockers. And puberty blockers themselves, you can stop whenever you want. And then at puberty, gender will evolve and develop further, without consequences. So it gives you thinking time. 
but people also worry about the consequences of puberty suppression. For example, for bone development. Another worry people have is on brain development. What we call GnRH treatment, or puberty blockers, is chemical castration. And it can affect mental health in an unintended, undesirable way. So it's very important that the patient and the patient's family are informed of this. Richard Nergath treats children with gender dysphoria according to the Dutch protocol and the current knowledge support. It is unclear how brain development is affected by puberty blockers. The body's growth and mineralization of the bones stop. When treatment is discontinued, the body is said to recover fully. The question is if this is true. In two studies, Dutch scientists have monitored 55 people over a long time. And those two studies both actually showed very good results. The adolescents improved in psychological functioning, and their gender dysphoria, or gender incongruence, disappeared. And in young adulthood, around the age of 21, they were actually fully comparable to same-age peers, so that was positive. The scientific support for the effectiveness of these treatments and the risks of the treatment is relatively weak. How do you feel? about treating a fragile, vulnerable patient group with so weak support. I'm very worried about it. And I think I'm not alone in that. The worry comes from the lack of long-term studies and that the Dutch study alone is not sufficient evidence. It has too few subjects, no control group, and was only done at one clinic. But information about the potential risks and lack of evidence never reaches Leo and his family. He starts treatment at age 11. He was happier for a little while, but then it got worse. His mental health got worse and worse. How bad was it? He was so unhappy that he attempted suicide several times. And he wasn't very old when he did it. And we couldn't understand why. We thought he'd get better from the kid treatment. Did you ever think, he's not better? Should we really be doing this? We kept thinking that it had to get better sometime. We kept hoping. All we heard is, oh, you're so brave. What great parents coming here. And you should be proud that Leo dares to come out as a trans boy and to be true to himself. And that made us happy, of course. We thought we must be doing the right thing. In the past five years, about 440 children with gender dysphoria have received puberty blockers in Sweden. To minimize the risks, the treatment time shouldn't be too long. We try not to treat them for too long. What is too long? We don't know. Then what is your reasoning? International guidelines say two years as a length of treatment. That can be defensible. So puberty blockers for at most two years is considered defensible. 
But Mission Investigate has uncovered figures that show that hospitals often treat children for longer periods than that. 87 children have taken puberty blockers for more than three years. What is your take on that? It's a big problem. Why? It increases the risk of side effects. This was a victory for Kira Bell, who, as a teenager, was prescribed puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones before deciding she wanted to transition back. London, the Royal Court of Justice, the 1st of December, 2020. A unique ruling that stops all hormone treatment of young people in the UK. Kira Bell sued the clinic and the court initially ruled in her favor. I'm delighted at the judgment of the court today, which will protect vulnerable people. I wish it had been made for me before I embarked on the devastating experiment of puberty blockers. Immediately afterwards, the NHS announced that the Tavistock Center, which has thousands of teens waiting for treatment, has suspended all new referrals. At Karolinska Hospital, Administrators watch the events in London with mounting concern. Attaching relevant documents on gender dysphoria to the current knowledge support from the National Board of Health says that treatment with puberty blockers is safe. But the British ruling shines a spotlight on the lack of science and the risks of serious side effects. The ruling also makes waves in Sweden. On the 1st of May 2021, KS stops all new hormone treatments of adolescents. The decision comes as a shock that divides medical professionals. We knew nothing about KS's decision. It was very sudden and shocking. There are six clinics in Sweden that treat children with gender dysphoria. The decision surprised them all. Afterwards, they came to different conclusions about the risks and continuing treatment. We briefly stopped hormone treatments for children here in Ostergutland, but after the national meetings with the Board of Health and many national stakeholders, we reinstated it. We here in Uppsala remain quite restrictive as regards to new treatment. We decided to be more restrictive in introducing new treatments. This means that we weigh every aspect of treatment with great care. Have you made any changes in the treatment routines? The answer is no. We haven't made any changes in the care we provide here. We provide essentially in the same way as before. This is a group of highly vulnerable people who are suffering in many ways. So it is very important to be able to help them. There are not enough studies that highlight the risks here and now as well as the risks in the long term. Because of that, there is good reason for the scientific community to do better. We have to know what we're doing. Have you had any patients who have suffered the side effects that KS describes in its decision? No, the answer is no. We have no such cases to our knowledge. Are you worried about it? We must always worry about potential side effects. Are you worried about side effects? No, not for the patients or for us. Can you understand them? You mean KS? I have difficulty understanding their decision. It's hard to understand how the clinics can make such different assessments 
as to the safety of the treatment. But there is something the doctors at KS know, but haven't reported. The first sign was that Leo's back hurt. It was like a dull ache in his back, the lower back and a bit higher. But he brought it up so seldom that his back hurt. So we didn't think so much about it, at first. But when we asked now and then how his back is, he said, it hurts constantly. He's been treated for over four years, and his health is deteriorating. That's more than twice as long as the defensible two years. To prevent harm, the patient's bone density must be monitored regularly. That hasn't been done, not once since the treatment began. Looking back, I feel such anger. Of course, anger at the professionals we trusted, but also at myself. I'm supposed to protect my child, but I haven't done that. Now, at last, Leo is sent for a checkup. In previous programs, we talked about Micah, who detransitioned. Regretting a gender reassignment often involves guilt, shame, and stigma. Since our first program, Micah has been contacted by more and more regretters through her website. Back then, she was anonymous. Now she is open with who she is. Hi, my name is Emily. And I'm the person behind the website dtransinfo.se. I decided to make a video to show my face and name because there were conspiracy theories that the website was fake that it had ulterior motives. I worry a lot that this isn't being taken seriously, that the healthcare system isn't taking any action. We're continuing down a road that is creating more regretters. We get a lot of email to dtransinfo. Here's one who writes, I'm worried how others would react if I had detransitioned. I don't want people to think that I was severely mentally ill. I don't want to meet someone and have to explain I made a big, big mistake. I've personally been in touch with around 20 people, people who have detransitioned. And what worries me, too, is that I know a lot of people hesitate to reach out. They think it's a really big step to take. So I get a lot of signals that there are more than we think. And here's one who writes, I don't know if the testosterone harmed my womb or my fallopian tubes so that I'll never be able to have kids of my own. Is there any hope? I'm having suicidal thoughts for the first time in years. And one writes, my gender dysphoria is, and here's another, even when I told them not to allow treatment, the treatment was still transitioning. We're guinea pigs something that there's no science to back up. 
Where in the medical field do you do that? Where do you gamble with people's lives like this? The new chapters, Support to Youths and Assessing Gender Incongruence, Emily's and other stories of regret, have gone all the way to the Riksdag, Sweden's parliament. Christian Democrat Michael Oskarsson questioned the Minister of Health, referring to Mission Investigate, Emily and the Kira Bell case. It's about teenagers, Madam Speaker, teenagers who we're allowing to make an irreversible decision. Yes, we can point to individual cases, but I don't think it's appropriate to base our decisions on them. This is about the principles that Swedish healthcare should be based on. I have to say I have great respect for medical expertise. When it comes to what type of treatment, whether surgical intervention or medication, and I'm not talking only about gender dysphoria here, but about all health care. I think the questions brought up here are super relevant. And it felt like she just brushed aside a lot of them. I'm a bit disappointed about that. There's a tendency to make it about whether or not trans care should exist. That's not what this is about. They have to start listening to our experiences too. They aren't doing that. Yes, there are regretters here in Sweden too. In its decision, Karolinska highlights the fear of regret, referring to Kira Bell, who first won her case, then lost on appeal. We discover that some minors have received hormone treatment here, at their own hospital, who now regret it. But this isn't mentioned in the decision. In several documents, incident reports, we read staff statements. One patient gets puberty blockers before the assessment begins, receives testosterone for one and a half years, then regrets it. Hospital reports it as a healthcare acquired injury. Patient referred to hormone treatment without preliminary diagnosis. Changed mind. Voice changed, healthcare acquired injury, patient regrets transitioning. Case after case of irreversible treatment of young people gone wrong. We get an interview with the head of Astrid Lindgren's Children Hospital, where the hormone treatments are given at Karolinska. We let him know in advance that this is specifically what we want to talk about. Incident reports and treatments that went wrong. In the guidelines, you also describe potential side effects. Why don't you tell the truth that you've seen injured children here? What injuries do you mean? We have several incident reports in which children who were treated here later regretted the treatment after receiving hormones, after irreversible changes to their bodies and voices. Where the hospital has reported this as a healthcare acquired injury, why don't you talk about that? I haven't received those reports. But the hormone treatment occurred here. I understand, but I can't react to an incident that isn't reported to me. I wrote about the incident reports in the questions I sent you. What did you think this was about? I checked if we received those incident reports. Sometimes the department head doesn't get them, and we haven't. So you're not aware of this? No. I realize it sounds strange, but you'll have to ask the kid team about this. 
There are two parts to the care of young people with gender dysphoria. Treatment occurs here at KS, but the diagnosis is made by the KID team. A part of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, CAP, in Stockholm. It was staff at KID who determined that patients had been harmed. But the treatment providers seem not to have been informed of this. Steve Berggren. Hi, I'm Carolina Jemsby. You're the head of division at CAP? That's right. Good, I was referred to you. I can't answer you right now. I need to familiarize myself with what this is about. We've already sent our questions to CAP about the incident reports, but they declined to be interviewed. Don't you think you have a responsibility to give us a reply on camera as to how this happened? The director of operations made the decision. I'm not going to question it. Then I have another question. I think you should contact our press office and Goran Raiden with your questions. Thank you. Goodbye. Director Goran Raiden's telephone. I'm Carolina Jabsby. Could I speak to Mr. Raiden? He's in a meeting at the moment. Director Goran Raiden's telephone. Hello, this is Carolina Jemsby. Could I speak to Mr. Raiden? I told him you're trying to get in touch, but he's in meetings all day. I can't say when he can get back to you. So the opening speech of EPATH In August 2021, an international conference was held in Gothenburg. Healthcare professionals and researchers developing trans care met to exchange experiences and thoughts. One of the opening speakers is Jiran Rostam from RFSL Youth. What is at stake with all this backlash going on? They state that there is too much focus on the risks of treatment and not enough on the risks of transphobia. Historically and now, our community has had our rights taken from us. Now the threat against trans rights in Sweden and in Western Europe is how gender-affirming health care is attacked with the idea of protecting children. The great challenge today is that our operations have been called into question. Are we really acting from a basis of science and proven experience? The challenging of our word expressed most visibly in the UK and here in Sweden. What do you say? Is there sufficient science and proven experience regarding gender-confirming treatment? Yes. The Agency for Health Technology and the Council on Medical Ethics don't see that there is sufficient science and proven experience. There aren't a huge number of medical studies. There are, but not compared with other disciplines or other issues. So, to be honest, there are fewer research findings on the subject. An argument that we often see in opposition to trans rights is, somebody please think of the children. I think some of you may recognize it. I hear some laughs. It's quite hard to do research on this, above all on children. This need for hard facts on things. Of course it's good, as much as possible, but this is a relatively new field in medicine. We are no longer fighting. You. We are no longer fighting to improve transgender health care. We're fighting to defend it. So we would like to shift the perspective off the risks of transgender care to more talk about the risks of transphobia. At the EPATH conference, you stated, 
that it's more important now to focus on the risks of transphobia than to focus on the risks of hormone treatment. What response did you get? Many people appreciated that lecture. They felt we brought important perspectives to the medical profession from a slightly different perspective. Thank you so very much for your talk. It was a necessary talk. The patient is well below the normal interval. So there is cause to be worried. We show the results of Leo's bone density test to Ola Nilsson. He hasn't met Leo himself, but he is a professor and endocrinologist and chair of the Pediatric Endocrinology Association. As with all new treatments, there is a worry that the treatment does more harm than good. Those who have treated patients probably feel there is support. But much of that support is based on old studies of patient groups that don't look like the ones we see today. So we have to be cautious. We have to make sure we have enough information before we carry out such intensive treatments as these are. I need more information about these cases. But if you're on puberty blockers for a long time, there is a risk of fractures. And it sounds as if this patient has spinal fractures. And what does that mean? That's serious. Last year we heard from Astrid Lindgren's Children's Hospital. And they said, yes, we see some abnormalities in Leo's bones, but it's nothing you need to worry about. Leo's bone density test shows more porosity than his bones should have. This graph shows the normal range of bone density at Leo's age. The yellow dot is his result. He is diagnosed with osteopenia. Two of his vertebrae have changed, mild wedge shape. Leo was treated for four and a half years before being sent to radiology. He has also stopped growing and is much shorter than expected. Despite this, the treatment continues for another three months. Leo's back, shoulders and hips ache every day. A 15-year-old shouldn't have to deal with that. His bones shouldn't look that way. A healthy skeleton that's been destroyed by this medicine. Don't you have a responsibility to read up on this before your child is given this treatment? Yes, of course we do. But when you trust the doctors, you trust them. You don't think you need to read up on the condition yourself. If a doctor you trust prescribes some medicine, you take the medicine. That's the complex situation. I think everyone involved in this case had good intentions. But now it's time to take a step back and try to get really good data regarding what's best, how to best diagnose and treat this group. So we do more good than harm, much more good than harm. Minimal harm and a lot of benefit is the goal of all health care. What is the hospital's responsibility, in your opinion? I don't want to comment on that. I mean, these are endocrinological treatments. Yes, but I think that people who carried out the treatments, I don't want to talk on their behalf. I 
can't defend them. It's better if they talk about it themselves. I'm not familiar with this patient, and I can't comment on individual patients. How can you not be aware of it? The hospital has known about it for more than a year. Your pediatric endocrinologist has talked about it. How can you not know? I'm aware that he's talked about a patient, but I don't have these details. You know that there is a case? Yes, I do. Why don't you say that? Until now, it's been anecdotal. I didn't know the patient. When you present this decision on new guidelines and mention potential... When we wrote the decision, I wasn't informed of this case at all. I know anecdotally that there's been a patient who was in contact with a hospital in Stockholm and that this person has had problematic osteoporosis with pain and vertebral problems. Leo has obviously been discussed among the managers at Karolinska, and we get a letter that proves it. The sender is a doctor who exhorts the management to act and write an incident report, but no such report is made. If someone had contacted me and said that I have this problem, then of course I would have made an incident report. But your head of pediatric endocrinology was told to make an incident report and none was made. I hear you saying that, but I haven't heard this information before. It's in this letter. But that's not how we work. I can't assess a patient in front of a camera in an interview. I won't. The doctor who exhorted Karolinska to make an incident report informs Leo's family that osteoporosis is an expected side effect of puberty blockers, information the family should have got before treatment started. Still, Leo's injuries are not reported. But then something unexpected happens. The doctor who raised the issue is himself reported by the kid team. They say he gave misleading and alarmist information to the family when he informed them of the risks of the treatment. We contacted the doctor who declined to be interviewed. In a phone call with Leo's parents, the kid ward gives an explanation of how things could go so wrong. It's really bad that there has been so little follow-up, absolutely. But this is really about the management not providing the necessary resources. First, they didn't tell us about the risks of the treatment. Then they don't examine Leo for all these years. And now they try to gaslight us about how badly he's been injured. And they blame the management. Then Karolinska talks about potential risks while our son is in pain every day. This is the bone density scan. This child has clearly been physically harmed by this treatment. Whose responsibility is it? Injuries caused by treatment we carried out are, of course, our responsibility. I'll look into this right away, but I can't comment more at this point. We've tried to find out if Leo's case is unique or if others have been harmed. It's confidential data. But we've got a hold of documentation about several young people whose treatment was discontinued after serious side effects. One child stopped growing but gained 25 kilograms in a short time. One child had reduced bone density after just two years of puberty blockers. One child is being examined for liver damage. We see children with badly deteriorated mental health after puberty blockers. 
In total, we've established that in addition to Leo, 12 kids in Stockholm have had side effects or healthcare acquired injuries from the treatment. It sounds terrible, but I have to see the data because we haven't had any incident reports. How can you not know this? Isn't it your responsibility? We have two units. The children's hospital handles the medical part and the kid team handles the diagnosis and psychiatric part. In the final days working on this report, we finally get an interview with Goran Ryden, head of pediatric psychiatry. I'm here now since you were so insistent about interviewing me. He got our questions in advance so he could prepare. We've been able to establish a total of 12 cases where children have been harmed, regretted, or suffered serious side effects who are patients of yours at KID. Is it time to go through all that records to see what side effects children have developed after this treatment? I can't answer here and now if that's what we need to do. But we always ask ourselves these questions in various ways. We're going to go through these cases again, those we know of, to get a better idea if there's something we've missed where we should have communicated better. But looking at Leo's case, how could it go so wrong? He's your patient. I can't answer because I'm not familiar with it. There hasn't been an incident report, but we'll look at it. Why hasn't there been an incident report? I don't know. But an incident report was made about the doctor who complained and informed to the family that osteopenia is an expected side effect. An incident report was made about that from the kid ward. What do you say? I can't go into the specific incident, why they haven't made an incident report on this case from the beginning. I have no answer. Why the kid team or endocrinologist chose not to make an incident report. The kid team wrote misleading and alarmist information Incident reports are written by individual staff, and alarmist isn't a reasonable formulation at all. We have to work with that all the time. What do you think of the fact that this family hasn't even had an apology? The only apology they get is a reference to the management and lack of resources. Is that reasonable? It's unfortunate if a parent or patient receives a description like that. Lack of resources is a poor apology to an individual patient. My thinking is that the questions you're asking about this patient have to do with the somatic treatment, the physical treatment. It's related to the hormone treatment. Svante Norgren says he can't answer because you didn't send him information and you say it's the responsibility of the endocrinologist. Where can the patient turn to get answers? I think Svante Norgren and I are essentially in agreement about this. The trick is getting the collaborative effort to work well. So you both agree it's the other person's responsibility? No, I think it's about how we piece together good information so the patient feels they, they receive comprehensive care. That's what has failed or created the difficulties here, that they're pulled in different directions. But who is responsible? We're both responsible for our part. Will you report yourself under Lex Maria? Are you discussing that? Isn't the interview over? Can you answer the question? If it is a healthcare related injury and it's serious, of course we'll do the Lex Maria. Are you looking into an incident report? We've just begun. You mean you'll begin after the interview? Look, we the interview is over. Those with the ultimate responsibility blame each other. A year and a half have passed since the injury was discovered. And now, after our interviews, an incident report is written about Leo. Karolinska Hospital is also initiating a review of the case.
Physically, there's no way to fix much of the damage that's occurred. But mentally, I think he feels better. It's important to remember that this is a patient group with a great need for support and care. Hormone treatments have helped young people to live as themselves. At the same time, physically healthy children have received injuries they will have to live with for a long time. And no one knows how many of them there are. The patient is suffering, and you want very much to do something to help them. You want to have something to offer them. And I think that's a component of the fact that we're in this situation. We hoped Leo would feel better, that he'd get help to feel better. That was all we wanted. We trusted the hospital. I blame myself a lot for Leo suffering this way. <laughs> 